Okay, good evening everybody and welcome um, to our Facebook Live uh, webinar tonight. Thanks ever so much for joining us and sparing your time on a Sunday evening. Um, Saturday evening even, <laughs> I'm ahead of myself now. Uh, what we're trying to do is um, keep this relatively short and punchy, but there's a lot of information we're going to get in. Uh, Dave and I are that passionate about running, we can talk about running for hours, but oh, we'll yeah. try and keep it a bit punchy for you tonight. Um, so I think just talk briefly through, introduce us, and then we'll talk, we'll get started. Uh, I'm Chris Hulse, one of the race organisers. With us is Dave Taylor. Thanks, Dave. How do you do? Uh, Dave's our resident coach, training coordinator, and uh, looks after training runs, pacers, looks after a lot of the press and media for us as well. We've also got Mark Curtis from Katie Copeland Physiotherapy, who will be talking a little bit about last minute niggles soon. And we've got Liam from Up and Running, who's going to join us live from store and uh, show you a few bits of stuff that they've got around that maybe help on race day. And we've also, um, we know many people are running for charities and we've got Karen, who is the chairman of Northern Lights, uh, our race charity this year. So Karen's going to tell you a little bit about that um about the charity and um and then we'll finish off and we'll have questions at the end so anybody's got any questions please feel free to fire them into us and um we'll, if we haven't covered them as we go along we'll cover them at the end so please feel free to get involved give us a like give us a love if you're enjoying it let us know you're out there it's always nice to know that the people there and then we really hope you manage to take stuff home with you tonight that will help you have a better race uh, two weeks tomorrow. So uh, I think the first thing from us is just say a massive thank you for choosing to uh, enter the race and choosing to run with us. The last 18 months have been far from normal and we're still far from normal now. And as we try to get closer to some form of reality, it's really nice to start having events again. And maybe not everybody's racing as such at the moment, but I think just be participating in an event is really important. Uh, so well done. And again, don't really think about racing uh, on the race day. If you're, not, if you're not at your best, just get out there and enjoy it and treat this as a stepping stone on your journey forward back into, back into running. Um, I think we've all got our reasons for running, and um, be that fitness, weight control, raise money, or those of us who are absolutely mad about it and love running. So we've all got our reasons, and um, let's keep those in mind when we're actually training and, um, over these last couple of um, weeks, but also on race day when we're trying to achieve our best. Um, so I'll hand over to Dave now. Dave will pick up a little bit from you. Which now. I'm going to bounce straight back to you, Chris, because I think uh, <clears throat> the big question everybody's going to be asking is what special arrangements will be on race day in relation to COVID? I think COVID has dominated all our lives over the last 18 months, and, and rightly so. And being cautious has certainly been um, the, an important thing to be aware of. And one thing we're trying to do is be responsible, be cautious, but also create an event as well at the same time. So we're turning, we're turning a fine line. But the things that we are doing is that um, we're going to have, the start area is going to be a little bit different. It is still going to be a mass start, but the actual areas where you start, if you're looking for a 2.15 marathon finish, the area for that 2.15 finish time is going to be much bigger than you used to. So you're going to have the opportunity as you cross the start line and before you cross the start line to stay a reasonable distance from other runners. And that's really, really important. And what we're asking those of you who may not be that bothered about it, just to think about other people who you may be overtaking, whatever, and just allow them some space around them to make everyone feel I happy about that. I have to say it really worked well in the, the 10K that we did recently. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that, Dave. Uh, Dave knows that through experience because he was actually in the field and actually ran the race. And Dave's actually going to be with you in the race this year because it's important to us to get feedback from you and have people on the ground. So I think it worked well for the 10K. So hopefully we'll be doing something okay. allowing people a space start. Um, indoor areas. We normally have quite a few indoor areas, particularly at the start. We're having almost none this year and again the idea is to keep everybody outside in the fresh air so um things like the help desk and the baggage storage we are going to have baggage storage but they're going to we're going to have the whole side of the marquee open so you can stay outside 
um, when you're dealing with your queries or handing your bags in or collecting them. Um, the, finish, the finish will be slightly different again because what we're trying to do is minimise touch points. And again, this is something we trialled at the 10K in July and worked really, really well. It's always lovely to have your medal actually physically presented to you. But what we're doing again to reduce touch points, your medal will be in your goodie bag. And um, the shirts, you will be picking up your goodie bag and you will be picking up your shirt from across the table. So again, that's aiming to keep everybody safe. I think there's been a lot of talk about super spreader events recently, concerts and what have you. I think that's very different to what we're going to do because we're allowing everybody the opportunity to keep that distance so we won't be on top of each other. And it's really for everybody to keep moving as they finish to maintain that distance so we don't bunch up. So I think that's really important. And hopefully uh, it will work really well. Um, the other thing people are asking about is spectators. And certainly what we're going to do is we're encouraging spectators and it'd be great to have spectators. Maybe if you're thinking about safety and distancing, which again is important, is ask your spectators maybe to actually get out on the course a bit so we can spread out, have more support around the course and uh, maybe after the race, meet up somewhere instead of being really, really busy on Northgate Street. Um, again, it's consideration for everybody around us and trying to keep us all safe. So I think those are the key things that we're looking at against COVID. There will be plenty of opportunity for sanitising stations they, uh, as you enter the race course. There'll be sanitising opportunities at the finish and um, certainly within the port So trying to keep it as safe as we can. OK. Right, we've had our first question, Chris, and, and it's about pace. I mean, it's something that everybody seems to agonise over. Um, but by the end of your training, you should have a pretty good idea of what your target is and hopefully plan the strategy to achieve it. Um, but that's under constant review as you work your way through your training programme. And it may well have changed over the last few months and needs to reflect your current state of fitness. Um, using me as an example, uh, when I was, uh, I found out I was able to do the Chester half uh, after 10 years of not being able to do it because of involvement in the, uh, in, in the organization itself, um, I picked up an injury. So, um, and this has um, been uh, a factor that has, has plagued me for, uh, for months. However, um, I've had, that means I've had to change my uh, strategy um, to, a point, uh, to the point where I can get through the race, but not um, in a spectacular fashion. So my normal race pace under sub nine minute miling is now down to my marathon race pace, or hopefully anyway. Um, and um, that's just with the intention of getting around the course um, maybe in the last few miles there won't be any pain and I'll go bonkers and I might go whizzing past some people, but we shall see. But I think, Dave, what Dave's saying there is certainly recognises what we're saying. Within COVID, we've not had the opportunity to race, to train as hard as maybe we would have done. So let's all be realistic. Let's go out there, enjoy the race, have a good time and, and finish with that appetite to say, right, well, next time I'm going to do a little bit quicker mm. or I really enjoyed that. What a fantastic way to run. I'm going to run all my races that way. Mm. And uh, certainly whatever works for you, make sure, repeat it, make sure yeah. it happens. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, everybody's last run, big run should be uh, this, this weekend uh, and the, the tapering starts. Um, you making sure that you're fresh and rested for race day. Um, I like tapering and um, all the hard work's done. And now it's a matter of recharging the batteries. Um, the iron, well, there's a conflict there because you've, you've been so used to training hard and then suddenly um, the brake goes on or your, your foot is going off the gas pedal. Um, and you think, oh my God, if I'm not training hard, within two days, I'm going to lose all my fitness. These are the kind of irrational thoughts that we as runners go through. But, but, and here's me putting my, my coach hat on, you need rest and recovery. This is as important as all the efforts. So you need to um, really uh, take that on board um, 
and it's it is as, um, as important as the efforts trust me so any hard stuff you do in your taper could actually sabotage the whole process um you get to a point where nothing you can do is going to make a difference but things that you do do could actually sabotage yeah, you I, I just emphasize that one day i think the training is done now yeah so anything you do now if you say i'm not quite there i need to really run hard this week mm. you're not going to get fitness you're not going to get speed benefit from that it's just going to risk your fitness and risk your performance on race day sure. so just to double amplify that one <laughs> again because i've done it i've made all these mistakes oh in the yeah past. yeah I'm... okay um I think the next thing we're talking about now is, is being fit and well to run. And that's really, really important. And we talk about the COVID and you'll see this in your race instructions. We've got to be responsible for ourselves and to others around us. If we're not feeling well, and it's certainly um, if we're not up to running, then be very, very responsible to yourself. Look after yourself and aim to run again. I think it's, it's really, really important. And again, with that in mind, I think... Um, Mark Curtis, Dave's just going to slide out to the side. <laughs> and uh, Mark Curtis from uh, Katie Copeland Physiotherapy. Right, yeah. 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 Uh, thanks, thanks Mark. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, and thanks for Hi, everyone. joining us as part of this um, final countdown seminar for the SR Chester Half Marathon. So over to you a bit, Mark. Yeah, talk about... Thank you. Um, so, yeah, really, I'm talking about um, on this tapering period, um, there's a lot of people that start to reduce their activity, the amount that they're running, um, and they've done really well with their training, but then they start to get these niggles coming on, uh, and they're actually doing less, but starting to get aches and pains and really starting to get worried. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a guru of mine in the physio world who's, uh, who's into running, and he calls it uh, taper tantrum, um, and it's a great way of uh, displaying uh, that. The, the idea really is that you've worked the muscles and you've worked the body really, really hard. And it's for most people, it's a lot of repetitive strain that's going through the body. Um, and then you're taking your foot off the gas and these niggles start to appear. So what can you do to try and minimize that if that is happening to you? Uh, so the first point really is just try and stay calm. Okay. Um, the other thing really is to plan. Um, if it's now you've got two, four weeks or whatever to the race day. Um, so there's plenty of time to try and uh, take stock and make a plan uh, to get yourself in as good a condition as you can um, you don't want to be pushing things too hard uh, you, you you've worked really hard like you said the training is done this is the tapering side now so if you're starting to feel niggles and things don't think oh I really should push myself back in and try and do another big run or another speed session or another hill session um, stick with the body stick with the tapering and just let everything calm down okay um, and whether it's two weeks to the race or whether it's two days there are things that you can do okay so treat the area okay try and let it settle down so you can take hot baths um, radox or some epsom salts and things to try and reduce muscle aches um, you can do massage so sports massage is a great way of reducing tension and tightness in those achy muscles just um, one, if you're going to have a sports massage, Mark, yeah. when would you say would be the ideal time before race day? I wouldn't say any kind of deep tissue massage uh, or foam rolling. If you use foam rolling as a, as a release technique, you shouldn't really be doing that 48 to 72 hours before the race because you can cause some muscle soreness. So you don't want to think, oh, doing a really good deep tissue massage the night before the race and you wake up and think, oh, <laughs> Lordy, they've got that one spot in the back of your calf and they've really gone to town on it. It feels nice and loose afterwards. You wake up the next morning, you've almost got a, a bruised muscle or something. Okay, so well, thanks for that. Good 48, 72 hours there before the race is a good idea. Um, so yeah, massage is great. So finding a good sports massage uh, therapist. Uh, we've got one at the clinic and there's loads of good ones around Chester using the foam roller as well, uh, doing stretching to the area. But again, this is the taping period. You're not gonna get massive improvements in flexibility in, in, in if you're doing strength and conditioning, you're not looking for gains, you're looking to calm everything down. So gentle massage, gentle with the foam roller, gentle stretching, don't push yourself too hard, okay? Um, but then support the area as well. Um, it is something like a neoprene wrap around the knee if that's a little bit sore or a calf sleeve. Um, or using kinesio tape over a sore area to offload it um, and make those uh, those joints and aches and muscle pains a little bit more supported and comfortable. Okay, 
Um, so other things, rest and recovery also means sleep as well. That's when you're getting the most recovery out of your body. So make sure that you're um, having a good of eight hours at least really with your sleeping. If you've got disturbed sleep patterns and things, try and think of ways to improve your sleep uh, to aid your recovery as well. Okay. Um, and take the pressure off. Um, it's like, like Chris said, it is a race, but it's better that you actually start the race. Uh, it's better that you finish the race. Um, so we're not looking for PBs and things. And if you've got some niggles and injuries, um, treat this as a, as a, as a gentle race that you, you, you're getting back into normality, like Chris said, and, uh, and Dave, and, and enjoy the race more than anything else. That's it. I think certainly thinking about that, if you've got a bit of niggles and you're starting to get a bit tired in the last couple of miles, there's no shame in walking a little bit. It's amazing how much recovery you can get by walking 100 metres. And you will probably find that your actual pace will be faster than it would if you kept on running. So I think that's just from personal experience, that's something, an, yeah. an idea. You think, oh, oh, heck, 30 miles is still a long way. There are different ways of attacking it, so that's a thought there. And it's cross-training as well, I meant to mention that. So you're doing repetitive exercise, running, doing impact, impact, impact. Uh, so doing some cross-training, go for a swim or go for a bike ride, do something different so the body's worked in a different way. Um, again, at a gentle pace, at a nice low level, that can be really helpful to, uh, to ease the muscles and the soreness. Brilliant. That's great. If anybody's got any specific um, questions on physio or what have you, then drop us a note uh, on the on the Facebook Live and Mark will do his best to come back to you and help Absolutely. or yeah. uh, give you ideas on how to uh, move forward. So please. Um, so thanks for that, Mark. No, it's really great to have you on the board. Much, and, uh, Good luck to everyone as well. Keep on there. Mm -hmm. uh, Here's my trusty sidekick back. So welcome with, back, Dave. With a great question. Oh, great question. Okay, this, Dave, right. let's go for it. This is from Michael. I'm doing the Great North Run on the 12th, then Chester the week after. Any tips? Stay in bed for the whole of the week in between. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, um, it's what I said before. Nothing you can do in between is going to improve the second race. Um, but you can sabotage it big style by trying to do any significant training. Plenty of walks, plenty of fluids, plenty of sleep, uh, uh, as Mark said. Um, and uh, really just, just keep on the move of a few little jogs. Yeah. Uh, and I would say treat one of the races perhaps as an A race and one as a B, but don't try and do two A races. Yes. And not trying to influence your decision on which one is your A or B race. <laughs> Uh, those of you who've run the Great North will actually know that chest is quite a bit flatter and faster. So if you're looking for one or one or two to choose CB race, that's up to you to decide. We don't want to influence it too much. Well, that leads on, and this is not contrived, Chris. This has actually happened. We have a question from Darren. Is the course nice and flat? It, you ironed the it last course week. Didn't is you? Absolutely lovely. As Dave was saying, yeah, we've been out there ironing it. And for those of you who've run it many times before, we have actually ironed quite a big section of it. Those of you who are used to running over the main dual carriageway that goes into North Wales, and then you turn back onto the side road and it goes over that little but very steep bridge um, by the farm. We've actually taken that section out now, and also the farm lane that was up and down a bit before you got to Sorgal has actually gone. Instead, we're doing a nice, very flat and fast, fast if you want to run fast, section oh, yeah. tour of the village of Mollington. Oh, yeah. So there you go. So that's, that's where we're getting the miles in. So it's certainly faster and flatter than previous years. But the one thing to keep in mind is there's that little hill as you come back into Chester. And all of you on the finish line will be telling me that wasn't a little hill but it is really in the big scheme of things. So you've just got to save that little bit of energy for the final climb at about 12 and a half miles. Um, why is the hill there? Well, I say blame the Romans. because <laughs> They chose where Chester is because it had a bit of a vantage point around the surrounding areas. So uh, don't blame us, blame the Romans. So. Right, on that note, Chris, it is time for your classic pointy stick story. Ah, uh -huh. right. Well, I think we've all had our pointy sticks out over the last 18 months. And the pointy stick is really, you don't want to be catching anybody else's bugs or illnesses over the final couple of weeks in particular. 
So it's really making sure, uh, and if you're not sure, if you think people are coming too close to you, then I did it once actually. <laughs> you actually get a, a garden cane, sharpen the end of it, two, two meter cane, and you just walk around with it in front of you. If anyone gets close, just poke them out of the way. So that should certainly help enforce the two metre guidance. Or oh, so, wear a face mask all the time. There you go. Yep. You don't need to do it when you're running. Unless you really want to, of course. But I think there should be plenty of space when you're running the face mask won't be needed. Um, a, a few more couple of things in terms of final hints and tips. Um, there's a lot of information on the website. There is a very detailed runner's information booklet on the website that's got all the information hopefully that you'll need again if it's not there if there's something that you what you want to ask about then by all means ask us and uh, fire it in and um, via social media and we'll do our best to get back to you on that one um, we talked about uh, resting up hydration is really really important i think don't forget your two liters a day of water and if you're training and sweating it's more than two liters. So keep well hydrated, make sure you're replacing salts and electrolytes. And certainly if you are starting to get cramps or what have you, then a pos two possible reasons for that are that you're dehydrated and or you're low on salts or electrolytes. So there's certainly things that you can keep on top of. Um, free race carb loading and hydration. I think again, the important thing is here is to be sensible and not overdo it. And the one thing we say here is uh, just think about the last meal the night before, have it by 5 p.m. Um, I, that allows nature and your digestive system to do its, uh, to do its job, uh, the aim that you're not carrying around too much extra weight the next day. <laughs> and that certainly um, helps there. Um, Dave, I think you, you, one of your things is about kit, your bugbears. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you asked me that because we've have had a question. It's from Deirdre from Doncaster. Oh, uh, I'm a well known uh, favourite. Well, yes. Yeah, um, asking what whether it should be a t-shirt or a, a vest. Now, from my point of view, I, I mean, I've been I've been a runner for over 40 years and a, and a competitive runner for that time, and I've always gone by if I'm in if I'm racing, it's vest and shorts. And that's partly because I generate a lot of heat when I'm running fast. I, I dimly remember what running fast <laughs> was, Chris. Um, but also, um, it's like a uniform. You've got your race head on and away you go. So um, I always feel really uncomfortable and um, limited if I'm even training it in a T-shirt, unless, unless it's really cold. And even then I'll wear a base layer rather than a t-shirt. It's all a matter of preference, but certainly uh, given that in the, in the fortnight style when it's the half marathon, I don't think it's going to be frosty or, or uh, you know, snow on the ground. I, I would recommend a vest, but I am biased on that. Okay. okay. I, I certainly, again, one thing somebody said to me quite early on is never dress for the first mile. You will warm up. If you dress, if you're a little bit cold before the start line, oh, I'll keep an extra top on, you'll be regretting it by the end of the mile. So to be feel a little bit chilly on your first mile isn't a problem. But while we're talking about kids, I think now is the ideal opportunity to uh, introduce um, Liam from Up and Running. Um, and Liam's actually in store and he'll talk us around a few things on kits and what have you. So welcome, Liam, and thanks for joining us. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having us. Um, Liam, so yeah, so you I'm... need to push yourself off mute. <laughs> off mute. Still okay, mute. Chris. Still can't hear you. You'd think after 18 months we'd be able to hear all this. Right. Okay. Where are we going? Okay. This is you, Amanda. Shall we carry on? No, we can't hear Liam, can we? Can you hear? Yeah. Cool. All right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about race day kit and give a bit of advice. Um, as with other things like pre-race breakfast, race day is not the time to try something new uh, in regards to kit. Stick to things that you've tried in training, in particular things that haven't bothered you or irritated you, 
on those long training runs. Uh, tops, they should be kind of breathable materials. Dave's gone on about vests, T-shirts. Make sure you dress for 10 minutes into your run, an hour into your run. It, these autumn mornings can be a bit chilly, but uh, don't wear your long sleeves and your, and your jackets. You'll get too hot and then you'll end up taking your jacket off, tying it around your waist and it'll, it'll irritate you. Just kind of run for the kind of... Uh, past the first mile. Um, things like shorts, leggings, underwear, make sure that they don't restrict your movement. Uh, you've got things like uh, like the underwear, which is like um, no seams, anti-chafing, breathable, uh, rather than kind of cotton, cotton materials. Uh, if you are carrying little niggles and injuries, I know Mark touched on it before, you've got your things like your rock tapes, and then also things like compression sleeves. So I found those really good because I suffer with tight calves towards the end of races. Um, I found socks years ago that didn't give me blisters and that type of thing that I like using on race day. So the compression sleeves kind of help to make sure I can still wear my, my normal socks. And then shoes. Um, so there's a lot of things at the moment with all the carbon racing shoes. How are they going to get you a, 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 a nice shiny PB? But I'd, I'd advise to just to run in the shoes that you've done all your long runs in. Don't go and buy a new pair of shoes now. That's 200 pound pair of carbon shoes because you think it'll give you a PB of 30 seconds. Run in the shoe that's kind of you're used to, you've done all your long runs in, that hasn't given you blisters. Um, and that will help, help you on, on race day. Um, for the half marathon, it's kind of now time, last chance saloon for trying something new before race day. Uh, you've got probably your last long run tomorrow maybe um so kind of maybe think about going out in your kit tomorrow that you're going to do or use on race day and kind of give it a go um on race day as well you've got to think about your nutrition that you're going to take so obviously you're giving out the high five on the course if you haven't practiced with them already maybe pop into store pick one up and try it in advance um last thing you want is trying a, a gel that you've not used on race day and it's irritating your stomach. Um, and then also I know some, some events, so I've spoke to Andy, one of the organisers, and he like he's interested in runners carrying their own water. So you've got things like hydration vests, the belts with the bottles. If you've, if you've got one of those and use them in your long run, maybe think about using it on, on race day as well. Um, but basically, main thing is, don't try anything new on race day. Keep with what you've what you've had in in your training that hasn't caused you any problems. And I'll pass you back over to to Chris. Thanks for that, Liam. Um, I think we couldn't hear you all the time there, but hopefully everyone else could hear you. I think it's some great ideas on tip uh, um, on kit there uh, from Liam. I think if you're looking to try something new, get out there in the next couple of days, get it. So you can do a couple of runs in it. I think that's certainly advice from us. And Liam, just while you're listening, I didn't hear you talk about hydration packs. Did you cover that at all? Uh, yes, I we think did. A lot of people these days uh, are choosing to run with their own hydration, and there's certainly plenty available. So again, if you want to try that on race day, get down there, get the pack that is right for you, and practice it with it beforehand. You've just about got time for that. So. Thanks ever so much for your time on that, Liam, and uh, no worries, we'll catch up with you again soon. Cheers. Yeah. Okie okay, dokie, okay. what's next, Dave? Well, it's all about the, the kit um, the evening before and race numbers. Um... Okay, so um, where are we now? Ooh. Right. Sorry, I'm a bit out of kilter here. Okay, uh, in the evening before, uh, it's like really like a military operation and this is where you can get it right or you can get it terribly wrong and I remember the time that I um, arrived at the start of the land on no 10 uh, and suddenly found I'd forgotten my shorts so luckily a friend of mine um, was uh, had a spare pair and, and uh, I was good to go but uh, that after that I've always been checking and double checking um, what, what, uh, what I need to take. Um, pin your race number on your, your running t-shirt or your running vest. Um, 
that that evening. Uh, don't put anything new on that you haven't tried. Um, and as has had has been stated before, don't overdress. Uh, uh, kit yourself out to suit Lyle too. Um, avoid personal uh, audio. Um, if you can't manage without it, then please just put it in, in one ear um, and low volume because you're going to be missing out on the race atmosphere uh, and the camaraderie of, of fellow runners. Um, so, Chris, do you want to talk about um, setting the alarm clock? Okay, right. Um, it, it's... Um, where are we? Sorry, Dave. I was a bit of a crazy day today. I'm just trying to... Uh, get myself together, this is why it's really important to work as a team. I think, again, uh, race day morning, um, you're going to be getting there early. It's, although it's a nine o'clock start, you're going to be getting up very early. And we'd advise you to get up early, so you can get everything ready and get yourself sorted. Um, I can set your alarm clock, set two or three alarm clocks. On our phones these days, we can set two or three alarms. So mm. even if you push, kill it, it'll wake you up again five minutes later. Uh, the other thing that we need to be doing, we all need to do, uh, at least the day beforehand, is make sure our watch, stroke, GPS, what have it, is fully charged. We don't want to get on the uh, start line and find the battery is about to die. And, and again, another one for me, and certainly for beginners, I think if this is going to be your first half marathon, first time you've run that sort of distance, um, some people uh, might find running in a red shirt actually quite benefits because <laughs> if it's a hot day, you're running hard, you can certainly get a lot of chafing. And certainly um, on the finish line, um, it, it's time, certainly guys, girls, uh, plasters or plenty of Vaseline or something equivalent uh, on your nipples. Um, otherwise, um, you might find it can be quite painful. You might not realise till you get in the shower afterwards, but um, it's something you need to be aware of. And it's something a little bit of thought in advance. I swear by waterproof plasters, so they've always worked for me. Um, OK. OK, right. We've had a question um, from uh, Roger from Rotherham uh, talking about race day breakfasts. Um, Classically, it's always been th three hours before you're actually racing, which is a bit grim if, if you're racing at nine o'clock in a park run, which is probably one of the reasons why I don't do park runs at the moment, because I can't get out of bed at that time. Um, and um, it, it, that is mainly because you, you need to, your system needs to be have fully digested that, that um, uh, your food because it actually uses quite a lot of energy to digest food. And if you're running while it's still doing that, well, you're not getting the, the you know, all the, all the power you put into your battery is not flowing properly. Yeah, and, and I think the thing there is, Dave, it, is, it needs to pass through your stomach yeah. because when it's passing through your stomach, a lot of blood is diverted and you want that blood powering your muscles. So yeah. that's why we talk about the three hours beforehand. It's really important there. And I have to say, Chris, and I might regret saying this, you need to do at least two poos before the beginning of a race. If, and, oh, you've stolen one of my lines, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and in I fact, was... I try and go for three. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that, that's one good thing in our race, is we've got plenty of portaloos <laughs> on the race course. Well, that, but yeah. Again, another thing, when you get there, you, as soon as you get there, you join the queue for the lose, you come out and you go back to the end of the queue and go again. Yeah. I think certainly race day, nerves and nature do wonderful things. And it's all the better being a pound or so lighter anyway. You <laughs> might get a, a minute or two better on your race time. Shedding so the ballast. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to be that obsessive when I was a bit quicker in terms of short haircut, pick your nose, cut your toenails, everything. You don't want to carry an ounce or a gram more than you have to. Chris, anyway. Chris, I actually deleted your reference to picking noses uh, from, from this script and, you, <laughs> and you snuck it in again. Right, as you were. Okay, <laughs> so we, we've talked about arriving in plenty of time. We've talked about kit in the run. And I think uh, the one thing that we sort of say, we've all got an old hoodie or an old T-shirt or something that's ready to go for recycling. Hang on to that. And uh, you can wear that until immediately before the start of the race. And just as soon as you're about to get going, take that off. If you leave that by the side uh, of the fence in your start area, 
they'll be collected and we'll all go to clothes recycling. So it's a good home for your clothes that you've finished And with. I would recommend that it's a T-shirt from one of our competitor races. Uh, uh, absolutely, shed. Yeah. absolutely, Dave, because ours are far too good and you'll want to run in them. Yes. So, yeah, thanks for that. Um, parking at the race course. Um, the car park at the race course opens at 6.30am, but closes at 7.30. The reason it closes at 7.30 is due to, all, due to all the road closures that we have. So if you want to park at the race course, then sit the end to get there for 7.30, but allow extra time because there'll be a lot of traffic trying to get to the same place. Alternatively, there are thousands of parking spaces around Chester. So um, just work out which one you're going to go to and then uh, you can get there a little bit later. Um, sipping or snacking, staying hydrated is really important. Um, my sort of view is you can do that until about 45 minutes before the start of the race. Um, I would think about at that stage, either have half a banana or maybe a gel diluted with some water, mm. uh, if that's what you're used to having. And, um, and then from 45 minutes before the race start, don't, because that gives you time for the last minute loose start before you go to the start and before you start the race. Um, we've got the uh, baggage storage. Uh, baggage storage is back up and running now. We've worked Good. out a safe way of doing that. And, um, but the thing is the bags will be at the race course. So you'll have your nice spanky new shirt at the finish line that you put on over the top if you're getting a little bit um, chilly, but you'll need to just walk down the race, down the hill down the hill that the Romans built to put Chester on top of, just back to the race course to pick your bags up after the race. And it's literally less than five minutes walk. Yeah, in fact, we designed the race that way because you need a walk after a, after a run. And it's just put, and it's downhill, what's there not to like? Yeah, past all the cafes and bars. Yeah. And you can treat yourself to a beer on the way. Absolutely. Well, on the way down. Mm. Um, when you're actually ready to get into the start area, we talked about your target your strategy for the race and your target finish time. I think be realistic about that. And this is really, really important, especially in COVID. And we're asking, these will be signed, there'll be big signs and they'll be spread out along the race course. There'll seem to be lots of space in between them, but please respect that because that will give people space if they need it and if they want it to actually have some social distancing. Be realistic about your expected finish time. If you go in that, if in that area, then you will find there's far less need for you to be passing people. And again, enables distancing to be done far more effectively. Okay, Dave. Okay, um, talking Garmin's again, or, or alternative uh, GPS systems. Um, I've been at the start of many a race and switched on my Garmin with just a minute to go. And I think all the satellites were in some other part of the universe and it wasn't loading up at all. So I highly suggest uh, that, you, um, that you get your Garmin going earlier rather than later because, I mean, it's only a half marathon anyway and there'll be enough juice in the thing to, to keep you going through that. So at least quarter an hour beforehand, get, get your, uh, your Garmin switched on. Um, start steady. Let the eager ones go whizzing off. Um, you'll overtake them as they as they collapse. Um, you know, at about ten miles, you can just run over the top of them. <laughs> they won't mind. They won't feel it at all. So, you know, just start at your own pace. If people, you know, just don't be influenced by other people. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Just once you have started talking a little bit about the course. Um, we still starting and finish within Chester. The first mile is within the city. And in actual fact, the one mile point is actually, you'll be running underneath the finish gantry. So please don't think it's the finish and go, <laughs> hey, you've got another 12 and a bit to go. So uh, keep that in mind. But uh, you'll be able to see everybody there. And there'll be plenty of people to give you a cheer as you go through one mile. Um, We've talked a bit about Mollington. We've talked about the main road. If it's a hot day, we have some fantastic residents out on Parkgate Road who are out with their hose pipes for the 10K. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure they'll be there again if it's a hot day, but I think the long range weather forecast we've had is actually looking pretty good for running. So uh, be confident about that. Um, so I'm talking again, talking about the, um, 
once you come back out on Parkgate Road, around Mollington, coming back into the city centre, just over half a mile to go, there is a bit of a climb. And again, if you struggle on hills, if you like being absolutely useless on hills, there's two things that you keep in mind. One of them is to save a bit of energy, don't run absolutely flat out before you get to the hill. And the other one is actually to try and keep your effort level the same. Um, and the other thing I do actually with that is to, um, and I, sh I shorten my pace. So I shorten my stride when I'm going up hills. And that actually reduces the amount you're climbing with each step and can make it a little bit easier. So there's a couple of little tips for that hill. Um, so then if you do it that way and you cope with it well, you won't be, um, you won't be um, angry with me at the finish line. So we couldn't possibly be angry with you, Chris. Okay. Um, okay, the next thing we're going to do now is talk a little bit about um, charity. And we know that many, many of us uh, here actually run for uh, charities for good causes. And with that in mind, I'm just going to introduce Karen Jones, who's the chairman of Northern Lights Children's Charity, to tell you a little bit about the charity <laughs> and uh, what they do with their work. So welcome, Karen. Thanks Thank for you. joining us Hi, guys. Tonight. Hi, everybody. Okay, so I'm a chairman of Northern Lights. Um, we take children with life-limiting illnesses to Lapland to meet Father Christmas. So children between the ages of six and 11 over to Lapland. Unfortunately, for the last couple of years, well, for 2020 and again for this year, we've been unable to put that trip on, but we've dusted ourselves off like an awful lot of charities have to do now. We've dusted ourselves off and we are now well into fundraising again, ready for hopefully a 2022 trip, as long as it isn't too difficult to get somebody out of the country and back in again um, with all the testing and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, because of the, the, um, the type of children that we're taking away and the illnesses that they've got, we have been ultra careful and the hospitals have been ultra careful at care careful in saying that we really shouldn't be taking children at this point until everything begins to settle down again hopefully that it will so we have started fundraising again uh, I really appreciate those runners that have selected Northern Lights as um, as a charity to run for we are very aware that there's a lot of charities out there and every single one of them needs your help at the moment so if it's not Northern Lights please do you know do think about running for the charity any any money anything will really help us at the moment it's just been a really really poor time and understandable for charities um, and it would be really excellent if more people could volunteer and run for a charity if you want to run for northern lights we'd really, really appreciate it we have a team running on the day um, you can still go into your entry and change your tick mark and so you could say that you're running for northern lights and we'll be notified by the organizers but it would be hugely um it's so important to us really that we start to build the um, the number of people that are running and, and understanding what Northern Lights do now. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you, Karen. Right. Uh, thanks for your help on that one. Karen's now. good. Karen can go back for his dinner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks, Karen. I think uh, just quickly a little bit um, to amplify why we choose Northern Lights for our race charity. And it's the second stint that we've had with Northern Lights. They're an amazing charity that everybody, Karen and all the team are totally voluntary. So I think while they've not been able to do um, the trips to um, Lapland last year and, and this year, every penny that is raised will be in that bank and will be going towards next year's trip. Hopefully that can go ahead. It doesn't get spent on swanky offices, overhead salaries or anything like that. That money will be spent on those, those trips for the kids. So I think that's just to give you a little bit of reassurance out there. And that's why we think it's so important because every single penny we raise and help them with goes towards those trips. So what have we got next, Dave? We well, got... we've got a question. Okay. Okay. Now this is from another Roger. Roger. I don't know where he's from, so I won't speculate. But he says, with the, the half and full marathon so close, should we exercise or rest in between? Now it's a little bit like the question about the Great North Run and, and our, our race. If you're running, my viewpoint is, if you're running the marathon, the Chester Harp really is just a, a staging post on the way. Um, so you should be following your training plan for the marathon, which just so happens to have a fantastic half marathon that you can use for one of your long training runs. 
So that's yeah. why. And again, I think some of the training plans have uh, either 15 or 16 miles. You can tack a bit on beforehand yeah. and still get your run. Again, that will help you st strategize your pace for the race. And it's really important. We know there are so many people going for the Chester Triple this year, and they it's, it's proved so popular. And I think that's why we reopened the Aldi Chester 10K again for virtual or run your way running. Um, because we've got so many people wanting to do it. So it's part of our running journey this year. So um, yeah. Yeah. So, so just to finish answering the question then, um, do whatever it says in the schedule, in the programme. I wrote it, so just do as you're told, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you haven't seen David's, uh, uh, Dave's training plans, they're actually on the website, so there's a bit more information there. Yeah. But again, if you're not sure, I've got any queries, in a question absolutely and even if it's after the live webinar is finished we'll do our best to come back to you on that one okay just um a couple more questions um talking about emma is asking any advice for liverpool road now liverpool road is that little bit of a cheeky climb i think there's some of the climb on liverpool road she says she's run it five times and always walk i think again i've just remind you of what i said a couple of minutes ago it's a hill to shorten your stride, reduce your effort level, and keep moving. I think that's probably the best advice I can give you. Um, just, I think, again, we're talking about the race now and towards the end of it. Um, we're talking about how you fuel yourself through that as well. And I think talking about drink stations and energy gels now, we've actually got five water stations. We've got water at two and a half miles, 5.8 miles, nine miles, 10.4 miles, and 11.8. And the idea behind that, they're actually more frequent towards the end to give you a chance just to top up if you feel a little bit dehydrated. We've also got um, gels. Now, these are the High Five Isogel Berry Flavor. And um, the idea behind these is they're isotonic, so you don't need to take a lot of water with them um, to get the energy benefit. We've got two gel stations this year. These are at 5.8 miles and 10.4 miles. And the idea behind that is the gels will be just before the water. You pick a gel up, tear it, drink it, and then have a good slug of water afterwards. Having a good slug of water afterwards actually helps make the gel more diluted so that your can stomach can absorb it more quickly. And certainly having it at 5.8 miles will help you power through the second half. And the last one at 10.4 miles is actually uh, just give you that final little boost coming into the finish. People talk about um, recycling and what have you, and we, there's certain things that we are doing this year. I think we are with um, plastic bottles for the water. The idea behind that is if it is a hot day and people need to take on a reasonable amount of water, it is, an if, it is the most effective way of taking on water if you're not carrying your own hydration pack. I've tried using cups before and running with a cup, it goes everywhere but in my mouth and it's certainly not good for me. What we can assure you about our plastic bottles is they go into a closed loop recycling scheme. Everything, including the flip top, is recycled. And again, for the first time this year, our gel wrappers are actually going into a special recycling scheme that is arranged by High Five. So anything that is, uh, you will see the bins by the side of the road. If you see the gel wrapper bins, then please try and use them. If you don't, if you leave your gel wrappers or bottles close or in the bins, we will actually make sure that the gel wrappers go into the recycling scheme that High Five have arranged for that. Um, Lucy has asked, which energy gels would you recommend or ones you add to a drink? Well, I think certainly because we've got the high five ISO gels in the race, we would certainly recommend you give those a go beforehand. And actually putting it into a drink is actually a really good idea and it's really worked well for me. I did a, a very long race two years ago. And what I did is I put all my gels and electrolyte tablets into my backpack drink and it worked really, really well. I wasn't struggling with tearing them off or anything like that. And it melt, they were diluted to the right strength and it just worked well for me. If you're just putting straight a gel straight into an empty stomach, they can cause you to be a little bit queasy. So that's advice there. So hopefully, Lucy, that, that will help. Um, I think as you get into the race, you will be getting tired. Hopefully, we've given you some strategies uh, on how to deal with that. And certainly, your patient strategy is crew to that. But I think certainly once you start getting tired, the key thing 
is to break the race down into small chunks. You can do it and uh, just aim for the next lamppost, the next tree, keep going. Once you've done that one, oh, done that one, I'll have a go at the next one. And just uh, keep going like that. It's certainly a good way of doing it. Um, just talking about, um, going back to the race, Michael's asked how many people are running this year. We're not quite sure yet because entries are still coming in quite fast um, because people rightly so and understandably so are, are leaving entry till quite late because it's still a level of uncertainty, although we're pretty sure we're going to be okay now. Um, our runners are actually down by about a third uh, on, a, on a normal year. And I think that's pretty much standard across the board with most events. And um, it's really, really important for us, for the, the event goes well, everybody enjoys it, it goes ahead safely. So I think um, so that's where we are in terms of runners this year. Um, I'll just go back to my final sheet now and see if there's anything else we want to cover off. Hopefully we've covered all the questions you've asked. If there are any more, feel free to fire them in as you, um, as you pick up the, the webinar later on. And, um, Really looking forward, to, looking forward to seeing you on race day and uh, enjoy and enjoy the race and carry on running. Mm. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to Mark, Liam, Karen, and Dave tonight. And um, really looking forward to seeing you two weeks tomorrow. So thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of your running. Bye for now. Bye.